Welcome to the annual Kenneth N. Waltz Lecture on International Relations Theory. Uh, I regret that it's occurring on Yom Kippur, but in the midst of difficulty in settling scheduling arrangements, the fact that uh, it falls in this date was inadvertently overlooked. Uh, the Waltz Lecture Series honors Ken by presenting ideas of the most prominent scholars of international relations. Some have been protégés of Ken's, uh, others have been his opponents in theoretical debates. Uh, others have agendas altogether different. Uh, most have been long established figures who, if not close to retirement, have been in the business for a very long time. Today, advancing intellectual progress and vitality, we have an exemplar of the rising generation of international relations theorists and policy analysts, someone very accomplished, but who by academic standards can still be called a younger scholar. Uh, Erica Chenoweth of the Kennedy School has won three of the biggest awards in political science and international relations, the APSA's Woodrow Wilson Award and the University of Louisville's Grohmeyer Award for her book with Maria Stephan, Why Civil Resistance Works, and the ISA's Carl Deutsch Award. Uh, she was also named by Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top 100 global thinkers of 2013. Uh, now a professor at Harvard, uh, she's taught at the University of Denver's Corbell School and Wesleyan, and was educated at the University of Dayton and University of Col Colorado. Uh, today she'll discuss the paradox of civil resistance in the 21st century. So Professor Chenoweth, take it away. Good evening, and thank you so much uh, to Professor Betts and to Ingrid uh, for coordinating and inviting me here tonight. And thanks to all of you for taking some time out of your busy schedules uh, to come and talk about this topic. Um, it's a total honor for me to speak on this uh, lecture series. Uh, the one and only time I got to spend time with Professor Waltz was in 2010, the last time I was here, uh, giving a talk in the uh, I think International Politics Seminar Series, Paige had invited me to. And uh, Professor Waltz and I spoke for two hours uh, about nonviolent resistance at his request. Um, when he asked me for a meeting, I did not want to talk about nonviolent resistance with him. <laughs> I was working on a book on the topic and wanted to talk about anything else. So I kept trying to divert our conversation to opera, another one of our <laughs> mutual interests. Um, but Professor Waltz kept coming back to the topic of nonviolent resistance, um, which I was kind of newly engaged in research on. And um, by the time we finished our conversation, he told me he was convinced uh, about its potential efficacy uh, and it's about, about its um, possibility as a substitute for armed insurrection in many cases. And, um, you know, that was basically the, the last time I got to speak with him in person, although we chatted on the phone after that as uh, my research progressed. Um, but it was one of the more encouraging conversations I've gotten to have with a scholar whose book was the first thing I read in my very first IR seminar in graduate school. Um, so in 2011, that book came out. Uh, Professor Betts has mentioned it, uh, the book Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. And that, my co-author on that book was Maria Steffen, who's now at the US Institute of Peace. And when our book came out, it was right in the middle of a wave of uprisings that many people refer to as the Arab Spring or Arab Awakenings. And since the Arab Awakenings, and since the book has come out, I've had a lot of chances to reevaluate, refine, um, ask new questions about this field, and update the data that um, started to sort of produce the findings um, that we present in that book. So I want to, uh, tonight, um, walk you through something that I've become uh, accustomed to referring to as a paradox uh, of civil resistance in the current decade, um, which is the fact that, especially in the last 10 years, we've seen a complete explosion in the frequency with which people seem to be turning to mass unarmed insurrection around the world. But just as it has become the modal or even dominant form of mass insurrection around the world, it has begun to decline in its effectiveness. And so what I want to do is, is uh, first lay out a couple of different definitions and scope conditions for this argument, present you with some of the data that sets up this paradox, 
and then tell you a little bit about what I think is going on, uh, and then we can have a conversation about it. So um, first things first, uh, when uh, I refer to civil resistance, I'm referring to a method of conflict that many people refer to as nonviolent action, nonviolent resistance, people power, political defiance. It has many names because any term you pick has a lot of baggage attached to it. <laughs> so um, it used to be called nonviolence, uh, but people started to associate the term nonviolence too closely with pacifistic approaches or passive resistance, even in some cases submission to oppressive systems, and that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way, and so others started using the term civil resistance, which had much more of kind of a civic character to it. It was agnostic as to the morality of the technique and focused much more on the fact that people were uh, unarmed but using a variety of very assertive, at times incredibly disruptive, antagonistic techniques to try to promote change uh, in their environments. Um, when I talk about armed resistance or violent resistance, I'm talking about a form of action where people are generally armed and are using physical violence against their opponents. So um, this would be assassinations, guerrilla attacks, terror attacks, ordinary street fighting, and, and other techniques of, of armed or violent action. Um, and the types of campaigns that I'm going to show data for today are primarily maximalist campaigns. Uh, maximalist means that the claims that the uh, dissidents are using or are promoting are trying to overthrow the existing government or they're trying to become independent countries. So they have either a, a direct central anti-government claim or a territorial claim. The reason why I'm focusing on the maximalist uh, claims is precisely because so many people are skeptical about the utility of unarmed people power action in these types of conflicts. Um, when Maria, Stefan, and I started our research, uh, one of the key maybe prevailing views out there, albeit an untested one, was that when what you're asking for is extreme, you use extreme violent methods. And what, we're, what you're asking for is not extreme, then you can use reformist methods uh, or methods that are proportional to moderate claims like nonviolent action. And um, we wanted to, first of all, just ask whether if we only looked at maximalist claims, um, what on balance would be the comparison in the outcomes of these campaigns? And then um, in terms of the, the other uh, important definition uh, to consider, uh, when I talk about a successful campaign, what I mean is, generally speaking, a short-term outcome that means the campaign achieved what it said it wanted to achieve, the removal of the incumbent national leader within a year of the peak of mobilization. Um, it did so within a year of the peak of the mobilization. So for example, we, we don't call Gandhi's independence campaign a success because independence came so much later than the peak of the mobilization. And because of that, was pretty overdetermined. Um, and then uh, we also show, we try to show that the campaign had had a direct impact on that outcome. Um, so that it wouldn't have happened if the campaign hadn't existed. For example, if a dictator dies in office of a heart attack, we wouldn't count that as a success for a campaign, even though you could make the indirect claim that the stress of the, the political opposition might have had something to do with the heart attack. So um, with those kind of definitional matters out of the way, uh, let me proceed to a couple of the key observations that I mentioned at the outset. Now, what this is showing is a chart of maximalist campaigns that have set on using primarily armed and primarily unarmed methods from 1900 through 2018. So this is a frequency chart comparing the onsets of the violent and the red bars campaigns and the nonviolent campaigns. So remember, these are maximalist claims. And they're campaigns where there are at least 1,000 people observed participating over a during, uh, an enduring period. So it's not just one person waving a flag. It's a significant mobilization that continues over a period. And what you can see is that um, if you've been wondering whether the past 20 years have been surprisingly tumultuous around the world <laughs> with people in the streets all the time um, calling for the, the fall of dictatorships or whatever, um, that is definitely what the data are showing us. Um, but one thing that I think is really important and unique is the um, 
the simultaneous decline in the use of armed action at the same time, right? So it's not just that people are shouting more or, or opposing more, it's that they're doing so using nonviolent methods to a degree that we actually haven't seen in the past 120 years. Now, at the same time as, as we have kind of, I don't know, created the most contentious decade um, in, in history in the last 120 years, um, nonviolent resistance um, had become exceptionally successful in the past decade, and then in this decade has declined in its success rates precipitously. So um, these data are using fairly conservative estimates. Like I said, they're only looking at success using a very narrow definition. They don't count concessions short of full success, for example, like territorial autonomy, short of full independence. But um, what you can see is that armed resistance has declined in its effectiveness since the 70s. Um, there's a slight uptick in this last decade, but it's not statistically significant. Um, whereas for the nonviolent campaigns, they're still relatively more successful than the armed campaigns, um, but they've had an absolute decline in their effectiveness to about the same level as was witnessed in the 1950s. So um, this is really animating the puzzle for the talk tonight, which is why has nonviolent resistance become uh, so much more common in its frequency, um, but so much less effective in the last decade. So what I want to do is walk through three different um, kind of bodies of, of um, claims. First is uh, what has made nonviolent resistance succeed up to this point in the prior cases. Second, what is it about the campaigns in this past decade or their circumstances that have make, made them less effective? And third, um, trying to move us towards some kind of resolution of the paradox um, depending on, on these arguments. So. Um, one of the key concerns that I had when I started to um, delve into this question about the sort of descriptive finding that the nonviolent campaigns were more likely to succeed than the violent ones was that this was being totally explained by structures. Nonviolent campaigns must set on in democracies, for example. They must set on in systems where it's easier to fight. Um, the opponent doesn't have great military capacity. They live in a hostile region. They don't have international backers, things like that. And in fact, um, all of those arguments have been tested and proved to be totally indeterminate. In fact, the, the most powerful uh, determinants of the success of these campaigns are based on their own characteristics. Um, the first of which is whether they're very large and diverse in their participation and are able to sustain some degree of momentum, regardless of how the regime responds. The second factor that seems to uh, determine success is whether the campaigns are able to elicit shifts in the loyalties of people that reside in different pillars of support. So for example, security forces, civilian bureaucrats, um, economic uh, or business elites, state media, and the like. The third thing they tend to do is they tend to maintain discipline or have some kind of way to maneuver when repression begins to escalate. And then the fourth thing they tend to do is rely on a variety of methods or tactics rather than over relying on a single predictable and vulnerable method. So let me walk through each of these points. As I mentioned, the first thing that successful campaigns do is they get really big. And by really big, I mean uh, huge masses of people in the hundreds and thousands or millions um, constituting um, you know, somewhere between one and 3% of the national population. Uh, seems to be a, a pretty critical threshold of, of participation. And um, it is definitely the case, and Maria and I, we're not the first ones to, um, to argue that large revolutions are the most successful kinds. Um, but one of the things that really stands out about nonviolent campaigns in particular is that they tend to be much larger than their armed counterparts, something like 11 times larger as a proportion of the national population than the average armed campaign more people are willing to participate in nonviolent action. Um, and this seems to be true as a general matter across most cases. Now, um, one of the uh, things that kind of comes up around this is uh, the fact that it isn't just necessarily numbers, because when we looked at the, that chart that showed the number of people, it was looking at peak events. So we just counted like how many people showed up at the largest demonstration um, or the largest strike that the campaign had. Um, now, um, with my colleague Margarita Belgioso, um, we've done a study where we look at the number of people who show up at every event over the course of, say, 
14 years in a country or 15 years. Um, and then we're able to come up with what we are calling a measure of mass. Um, and then we can multiply that by the number of events taking place in the last week, and we can call that a measure of velocity. And so um, we, we kind of uh, conducted a study where we were able to find um, that actually momentum, which is that mass, the number of people in a country protesting on any given day, times the number of protests that have happened in the previous week, is one of the most powerful predictors of whether a regime will collapse that day. So it's actually an, an incredibly predictive um, uh, kind of metric for how close the campaign is to succeeding. So um, one of the things that uh, has come to light a bit more recently is that it might not just be the numbers that matter, but also who is participating. Um, so this might be especially the case in deeply divided societies where there are strong sectarian, ethnic, racial, or class divisions. Um, that the regime can exploit to divide and rule the population. So when the campaigns are able to elicit the participation of people that cut across um, these different cleavages, they're much more likely to succeed. And um, one of the um, divides that seems to be the most influential or impactful, perhaps because it affects all of those others, is whether women are equally represented in the front lines of the participant base. So in research that I just published this week, um, what I find is that um, when there is gender parity, that means 50-50 um, men and women participating in peak events, there is a much higher rate of or predicted probability of success for that campaign um, than if the campaigns exclude women participants. So it's not just that campaigns that are very large um, and very diverse and, and have momentum um, are able to just win by overwhelming the opponent. They win by really shifting the political game. And um, to, to sort of make this concrete, we have to um, tap into some of the really useful insights that others like Hannah Arendt and Richard Gregg uh, were writing about in the, the 30s or 60s, um, and then Gene Sharp was writing about in the 70s, related to the idea that there's no such thing as an opponent that any of these movements are facing that's um, basically in permanent power. They have to constantly replenish their power. And they're totally dependent on the cooperation, obedience, and help of people that work for them. So people in security services, people in um, civilian roles in the government, economic and business elites that kind of buy into the status quo, um, people who are um, kind of visible authorities culturally, religiously, or otherwise in the society who um, provide important signals to the rest of the people in the country, um, whether what's happening is legitimate or illegitimate. And so Gene Sharp and others um, have argued that basically um, the, the main function of civil resistance is to use this large mass of people to start to disrupt or pull away those pillars of support so that when the regime tries to rely on them, it, it can't. Um, a very concrete example of this at a micro level um, is an example from Serbia, where in 2000, there were hundreds of thousands of people descending on Belgrade in October to demand that Slobodan Milosevic leave after fraudulent elections. The elections were known to be fraudulent because there was a well-organized election monitoring campaign that had emerged from within the civil society um, amidst many ongoing student-organized protests. Um, and they were able to report independent findings that the vote shares were being inflated uh, in many of the provinces. So um, when it was clear that this was the case and Milosevic uh, declared victory, hundreds of thousands of people began to come from the provinces to the um, parliamentary square in Belgrade to demand that he leave. And after a few days, um, the security services who'd been sort of waiting uh, to see how they ought to react did get the order uh, to shoot live fire on the demonstrators. And um, we know that the demonstrators had stolen a few of the radios, so they heard the order go down. And they saw that none of the police moved. And so they just walked through the line into the parliament. Milosevic fled, flew out in a helicopter, and announced his retirement to spend more time with his grandson. Um, so basically, in this context, um, the critical pillar upon whom there was an attempt to rely, defected. And they didn't defect by throwing down their guns and joining the protesters. They just defected by feigning ignorance about an order that they didn't think was wise for them to follow. Now, 
it turns out that um, when journalists and academics asked those security forces, why didn't you follow the order, they said some really informative things, um, like, I thought I saw my kid in the crowd, or I thought I saw the guy who sells me liquor on Saturdays at a discount in the crowd, and I didn't want him to get hurt and lose my discount, you know? Um, so it's not so much about them, the, the dictator having to melt their heart. It's not even about the security forces having to met the, melt their hearts. It's more about um, kind of creating a crisis moment where people have to make individual level decisions about what's in their own personal best interest. And at times that can really um, have an impact on, on these large scale political outcomes. Now, the Serbian case is one where we can see that there's a homogenous, uh, at that point, a relatively homogenous society where the main cleavage was along political lines. And in fact, many of those security forces were conscripts from the provinces. So when they saw the mayor of Chachkik showing up in the tracksuit with his friends, they related more to him than to Milosevic and his cronies. This is not always going to be the case. In fact, there are many cases where the protesters are representing a minority group or a disenfranchised majority group, um, and the security forces are made up of another sector, ethnicity, or race. In these types of settings, many movements have not even bothered to try to elicit security force defections, but instead have focused on trying to disrupt economic systems and um, the economic status quo. So for example, in South Africa, um, there was much more of a focus on um, essentially withholding um, purchasing power um, from white-owned businesses under the apartheid regime um, in a way that then essentially forced business-owning whites to confront the government and demand um, that the, uh, the clerk uh, regime give way um, to uh, reformist elements. And you know, the, basically the idea is that each society is going to have its own pillars but there isn't any society that has none that are invulnerable to suasion in some way. So of course, many times in many settings, the government does crack down. In fact, in every case that um, I'm referring to here, there were uh, instances of lethal repression, at times even mass killings against uh, unarmed people who were engaged in nonviolent resistance. Um, so then the question is, what happens when, uh, when the regime does fire and the security forces don't defect in critical moments? Well, the first thing is that for nonviolent campaigns, uh, repression can be much ri riskier politically. Um, there seems to be a generalized pattern that even among those campaigns that do um, become the targets of intense uh, regime-led violence or pro-government militia violence even, um, there is a generalized tendency that uh, repressing unarmed people um, generates backlash or backfire. Backfire simply means that people find the violence against unarmed people outrageous morally, uh, disproportionate, excessive, and brutal. And that then can um, kind of allow the movement to clarify and crystallize its claims to legitimacy uh, over the regimes. Um, the second uh, reason why repression is very difficult for, uh, for regimes that are facing nonviolent campaigns is because it can become very practically difficult. Um, when there are huge numbers of people, when, when one to three to five percent of the population is rising up, um, it can be very costly uh, to deploy indefinitely uh, security services that are sufficient to suppress it. Um, which is precisely why many regimes rely on state terror. They want to create a psychological effect beyond that which what they know they're capable of imposing physically. So um, large campaigns um, with many different people from different sectors of society participating uh, can maneuver in moments where it feels as if the regime is about to crack down um, in a more violent way. Um, they can maneuver between what are uh, commonly known as methods of concentration, which is the lower left-hand corner. This is where people assemble mass at a particular point to disrupt. Um, it can be very visually appealing. It can bring more people in. It's what we see on the covers of newspapers all the time. Large numbers of people gathered somewhere is very impressive. It's also super dangerous, um, and it can also become predictable. People can get fatigued, and it can be hard to maintain the strategic upper hand if you're sort of doing the same thing over and over again uh, each day. So um, on the other hand, on the upper right-hand corner, what you can see is an example 
of a method of dispersion. This is where people stay away from places that they are not only expected but required to go uh, in order to maintain the status quo. So here we can see um, the effects of a general strike um, where the security forces are out in force. Um, there are three of them pictured here to police essentially no one. Um, they were told in this picture that there was going to be a, uh, a demonstration. They came out, they're probably being paid overtime. The demonstration was everyone was staying home and the, the shops were gonna be closed. So um, there are many examples of this um, where skillful and creative uses of techniques um, can actually impose really direct uh, costs on the, the regime without risking um, exposure to violence among participants. A very um, concrete example of the way that these methods can be kind of skillfully sequenced comes from the Iranian Revolution, which from 77 to 79 um, was a mass popular uprising of between 5 to 10 percent of the Iranian population against the Shah, uh, the U.S.-backed Shah. Um, it's important to put in context the, the French Revolution, which many people thought was one of the most popular revolutions in history, um, constituted about 2% of the population. So the Iranian Revolution with between 5 and 10 was a truly massive affair. And um, <clears throat> basically uh, what happened is for the first 100 day, or 90 days of the peak 100 days of that uprising, um, people largely relied on funeral processions, rallies, street demonstrations, and marches. They became very dangerous. Thousands of people were gunned down in the streets during that time. Um, and in fact, the funeral processions were usually for people who had been killed in the streets the day before. Um, so after a number of days in a row of this, it became clear that um, there was going to be kind of a moment of extreme escalation. But um, members of the, um, the sort of revolutionary committees convinced oil workers in the countryside to go on strike. And they paired that strike with a stay-at-home demonstration. So um, the internal security services went door to door to these oil workers' homes and pulled them out into the streets, marched them down the, to the oil fields, and when they got there, they worked at half pace. So the next day, same story. Oil workers stay home, security services pull them out into the streets, march them to the oil fields, they work at half pace. After four or five days of this, the security service uh, employees start to call in sick to work. Um, and you know, in the aftermath, it was clear. These were their neighbors and their kids were going to school with their kids, their, um, their family members were shopping with their family members and it wasn't gonna be sustainable for them in light of the fact the oil fields weren't pumping, they weren't gonna get their overtime to con continue to do this very uh, direct face-to-face -face kind of repression. So they decided not to continue. The Shah um, left power later that week. So um, some movements, of course, um, in the context of these um, repressive dynamics, um, opt to embrace or sometimes tolerate some degree of violent action. Often not armed action, but street fighting with police, for example, um, can become part of this activity. And um, many social movement scholars refer to this as still primarily a nonviolent movement, but one with a violent flank. Um, part of the reason why it's differentiated that way is because it's usually not the same people <laughs> doing the nonviolent action and the violent flank. It's not like one day you were the nonviolent demonstrator and the next day you became a, an insurgent. It's usually different components of the society that are emergent in different uh, aspects of the, the uprising. So um, what we know is that um, the movements for which there are uh, violent flanks that emerge, um, there is a slight reduction in their uh, success rates overall, uh, and we think, um, based on research that I've done and, and many others have done at this point, that the reason is because the membership homogenizes. Um, uh, Nonviolent movements that embrace or tolerate violent flanks tend to um, no longer have very many women involved. Um, they tend to sort of polarize the movement and um, deviate into uh, internal squabbling and, and fractionalization, and that then undermines um, their coercive capacity against the opponent. So um, these are kind of the, the four key things that successful movements from 1900 to 2006 were doing. They were large, diverse, and, um, and had a lot of momentum. Um, they maintained discipline. Um, they elicited loyalty shifts within the pillars of support. And they uh, shifted their methods so they weren't over-relying, for example, on protest. So what do movements in this current decade look like compared to those? Um, the first thing is that 
uh, they tend to be smaller, believe it or not, uh, than the average movement over the prior series. So uh, here's just looking at the average participation size um, by a proportion of the overall population. And you can see that uh, the, in the 1980s and 90s, um, uh, mass uh, nonviolent campaigns were incredibly participatory. Um, they, most of them hit these sort of major uh, critical thresholds of participation that are associated with success. And in our current decade, we're back down to the same levels that we saw in the 1950s. Incidentally, we're also at the same success rates that we saw in the 1950s. The second uh, thing that I've noticed with these new data is if you look at trends in uh, the adoption or tolerance of violent flanks over time, we're definitely at a point where about half of these mass movements around the world um, also have some element of street fighting, um, improvisational violence, um, engaging with police or counter protesters, um, using fighting and, and lethal violence. Um, the third thing is that uh, many of these campaigns seem to be less resilient to the regime's attempts to repress them. And part of this may in fact be because regimes have gotten better at avoiding the blunt instruments of coercive power um, and instead using what I and some others call smart kinds of repression, which are much more selective, which are much less politically risky, um, and which allow them many degrees of plausible deniability. So uh, these days, what you'll uh, see a lot of is, um, is leaders who are facing some kind of massive domestic challenge, um, accusing uh, foreigners and outsiders of interfering um, with their right to rule. They will also mischaracterize those who are uh, opposing them as coup plotters, terrorists, traitors. In this country, it's, also, it's often communists. Um, anything that is viewed as a broadly pejorative term. Um, the third thing that tends to happen is they try to co-opt some of the more conventional opposition leaders, for example, in formal opposition parties, um, so that they can't be organized against them. They tend to pay off their inner entourage to avoid those loyalty shifts that I mentioned. Um, they counter-mobilize their own nonviolent supporters. Uh, so it's much more common now that we see a, an, an anti-regime movement accompanied with a pro-regime movement on the sidelines. Um, there is a, a general understanding, I think, that the embracing of these violent flanks hurts movements, and so it's not surprising then that regimes often plant um, agents provocateurs or plainclothes police to provoke this type of violence. Um, the worst forms of repression, particularly uh, state terror, are delegated uh, to those that the state doesn't directly affiliate with. Um, certainly there's a, a large degree of censoring, uh, surveillance, and spinning of events. Um, journalists are largely expelled or controlled. Um, and one of the things that is the most interesting is something that my colleague Regine Spector came across in some of her notes um, from a program of a kind of Central Asian conference that she went to a few years ago, um, where the attendees uh, were sharing information about best practices in suppressing nonviolent dissent. This was in 2007. Um, and so it was ostensibly an oil-related uh, conference, but actually there, there was a lot of talk about how are we gonna suppress these nonviolent color revolutions. Um, and so most of these things were on that list. Um, the fourth thing is that I think most of the movements today uh, tend to um, focus primarily on protests and demonstrations. Uh, so most of what we see with, with movements, for example, even in the United States, um, is marches or demonstrations or protests. Um, occasionally we see walkouts. Um, this is data that I've collected with my colleague Jeremy Pressman on daily events of protests in the United States since the Women's March of 2017. Um, one of the things that is totally striking about um, what's happening in the United States is, first of all, the, the 2017 Women's March was by far the largest single-day demonstration in U.S. history. But um, the most um, eventful single-day demonstration in U.S. history was the Enough School walkouts for gun control, which was back in March of 2018, where there were over 4,400 walkouts of schools, including 12 home schools, um, where children walked out on their parents. Um, and Don't use any excuse. Yeah, right, yeah. 150 uh, kindergartens um, had walkouts on that day. 
Um, so that, that was one of the most um, uh, eventful in terms of the number of distinct events associated with a single day. We're still counting the climate um, strikes from a couple of weeks ago. Um, which look to be maybe the, the third largest in U.S. history so far. So we are having a moment in the United States along with everyone else in the world. Um, but the, the contention in the United States similarly looks like that elsewhere in the world. It's marches, protests, and such. Whereas um, what we know is that uh, these methods of concentration both, um, they can be somewhat disruptive, but n not unless they're associated with a broader campaign with a strategy for how to shift the political landscape and disrupt those pillars of support. Um, protests alone don't do much to shift the political game. Um, protests with a purpose can shift the political game, uh, especially if they're kept up over the longer term. Um, but the most powerful methods of nonviolent action that people have uh, yet discovered is the strike, the, the, the real strike, the, not just a demonstration that you call a strike, but an actual strike um, is the, the most potent method of economic non-cooperation that people have developed so far. Um, and many of the campaigns that we are evaluating in these data that have succeeded were able to successfully mobilize um, persistent general strikes in a way that completely um, cobbled, hobbled their opponents. And then the, the final thing I think is going on a little bit, and this is just more qualitative based on um, me talking to a lot of people about it, is that um, in many of the movements that we think of as kind of pinnacle, iconic mass movements, people power, the civil rights movement in the US, things like that, there was an extraordinary amount of community level preparation and consensus building and conflict resolution and negotiation among those who are going to engage in dissent way before they ever took to the streets. Um, so for example, at Fisk University, uh, where members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee um, were uh, essentially preparing to desegregate Nashville through lunch counter sit-ins and department store boycotts. They, uh, they said they met every single morning at 6 a.m. before going to university classes, every single day. Um, so I'm trying to think about what my college experience was like. <laughs> and, I, and that was a long time ago. But I don't think it's gotten too much better. Uh, um, if I was in college now, I don't know that I'd be waking up at 5 every single day to meet and, and plan um, a very high risk uh, activity. That might be on me, um, and it might be different. Uh, who knows? But, but I think uh, for them, um, you know, what they what they understood, and what many of the um, the leaders of this ultimately successful desegregation campaign have said is that, you know, those types of uh, interactions are totally meaningful because in order to maintain a sustained struggle, to have the discipline to maneuver, to know that you can move as a unit even when you have disagreements in the context of major setbacks strategically. And to have a strategy before you even start planning what the tactics and actions and, and uh, such are going to look like is critical for, um, for success. So these movements aren't winning because they're, they're right. They're winning because they, they basically waged a struggle incredibly effectively, just like the way that you know, a military campaign that is waged effectively um, would ultimately succeed, not because people liked them in the end, but because they figured out a plan. And I think that um, one of the things that is unique to our time um, is the fact that much of the activism today is digitally driven, which um, creates a number of major vulnerabilities. The first is the vulnerability of learning superficial lessons from other campaigns, like focusing too much on pictures of huge crowds of people in a square and thinking that's what nonviolent resistance is without focusing on the incredibly mundane, boring elements of the basement church meeting every single day at 6 in the morning as what really made the difference. Um, the second thing is that digitally uh, organized activism does allow, we know, for rapid mobilization um, and bringing huge crowds of people to a particular place, but it doesn't do much to encourage sustained participation, nor does it shift the political game by pulling those pillars of, of support away from the opponent. 
Um, another thing that it can do is, um, and uh, Seva Gunitsky, who I think was one of the, a PhD student here an, a few years ago, um, has found that essentially governments have now mastered the use of, of digital technology to not just surveil, but also promote their own effective propaganda about these campaigns. Um, so uh, the, there might have been a period where uh, digital tools were really advantaging um, mass movements or grassroots communities, but those we might have sort of jumped the shark on that. Um, and then the, the last thing is something that I haven't really seen too many people talk about, although I, I'm sure somebody must have published something on this, but it does seem like um, when, you, when, when there are these viral videos of really horrific incidences of police brutality or you know, Syrian forces firing on unarmed demonstrators or things like that, it, it, it can only serve the regime's purpose of spreading fear and, and demobilize people who are on the margins and who otherwise might participate if they didn't just have imprinted on their mind a grisly image of something just happening to somebody that looked just like them. Um, whereas before these technologies were all landing in our pockets on our phones, um, people might have heard of this, but they might not have seen it. And I think that has a different emotional elicitation. So um, does nonviolent resistance have a future, uh, given all of this? I think it does, because I think that the reasons why it hasn't been succeeding are correctable. Um, only if you buy my argument that it's because of things that movements are doing differently today, as opposed to the argument that there's something that has fundamentally shifted in the last 10 years in the international system. And uh, the reason why I'm a little more optimistic about the ability of movements to adapt and, um, and come back in terms of their effectiveness uh, is because for most of the movements that were uh, engaged in struggles against dictatorships and colonial powers uh, in the early part of the 20th century and up until the 70s, these were not like nice regimes. And there wasn't necessarily um, a system of um, accountability for those who were overtly violating human rights either. There may have been a brief period um, in the 90s and early 2000s where there was a sense that the United States and other members of the international community would engage in costly action um, to, uh, to protect or punish um, when human rights were violated uh, grossly. Um, but even if you take out those cases, uh, it is still the case that nonviolent campaigns were setting on all the time and were succeeding more often than their violent counterparts without any international assistance at all whatsoever, and often with the international community backing their opponents. So I, I think that there is um, some degree of um, optimism to be had, but I do think that it requires greater learning about nonviolent resistance and what it is. A debunking of the myth that if a movement is nonviolent, it's going to win, uh, because just like any type of political engagement, there can be pretty sloppily put together um, campaigns that are bound to fail, but that doesn't mean that the technique as such is unsuccessful. Um, certainly, I think that campaigns that move more into um, developing a strategy prior to planning actions are going to have a better shot than those that just go from week to week planning each protest that they're going to hold. Uh, and then certainly the, the fact that there's been um, well-documented authoritarian learning about how to suppress um, these groups suggests that there should be uh, much more coordination and, and lessons sharing among those who are uh, waging struggles using nonviolent actions um, in a way that expands or protects their own rights. So with that, uh, I will leave you with my everlasting optimism and um, welcome your comments and questions. Thank you. Well, I'll open the floor, but I get the first question. I get it. Uh, uh, it was fascinating. It seemed like uh, most of the focus was on the choices of resistors about tactics. Uh, uh, with, uh, maybe with the special exception, there was a slide on uh, diffusion of smart repression. Um, but uh, how much uh, uh, can you control for the nature and the actions of the government, the opponents, the amount, the amount of risk there is in civil resistance? 
um, the degree of repressive brutality, the discipline of security forces. Um, way back in the old days, uh, there used to be the fashionable distinction for a while between authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. We don't use the latter term much anymore, uh, but in some sense it seems uh, relevant. Uh, that is like, well, if you have a moderate opponent compared with some of the alternatives, like the British in India or the US government, uh, I mean, there are exceptions like Emirates are, but uh, anti-war demonstrations, uh, nobody had to worry about what was going to happen to them. Uh, or uh, moderate authoritarian cases like the Shah's Iran or Mubarak's Egypt compared with, say, Stalin's Soviet Union or Kim Jong-un's North Korea. How much of a difference does that variation make in uh, uh, the success or, or the trends? And lately, I, I'm thinking out loud, could it be that uh, oppressive governments have gotten smarter about how to roll with the punches, how to absorb protests uh, uh, and, and vitiate them? Great. So um, thanks for the question. Um, I've been troubled by this as well. And so uh, in some of my more recent stuff with uh, Evan Perkoski and others, we've been looking at the particular case of mass resistance against um, regimes that have used mass killings against dissidents. And one of the things that's the most striking there is that even in these cases, um, it makes a huge difference how the dissidents respond to increasing violence against them. Um, what we've found is that for campaigns that, that don't adopt violent flanks, even after they um, suffer a mass killing, they're more likely to succeed than armed campaigns that suffer a mass killing. Um, that doesn't mean that it's safe, <laughs> right? And, and, and clearly, like, what we're not comparing is whether mass killings happen when people don't challenge the regime at all, right? So it, it is probably the case that doing nothing in many cases is going to be safer for people than doing something. Although for some people in some communities, it is not safer to do nothing. Um, they, they have to do something. And so for those that decide they're going to do something, there's the question of, are you going to elicit more brutality if you use coordinated nonviolent action, or are you going to elicit more brutality if you use armed action? And almost across the board, um, it, is, it is definitely going to be the case that not only is the campaign going to suffer greater um, brutality using armed action, but people who are associated or not even associated with the campaign, but are, are thought to be part of it, will suffer as well. So it has like really intense um, externalities beyond the dissidents themselves, and that tends not to be as much the case when, when people are using nonviolent action. Then, of course, there's the question of um, are people using nonviolent action because they think they're up against a nicer regime, right? And so um, that's part of why we limit our study to only regimes where they're, they've already engaged in mass killings um, because we know that these aren't nice, you know, they, they, they don't feel limited in their brutality, but they can be limited by the conditions as they shift um, among the movements. We have started to look more at questions about regime types beyond autocracy, totalitarianism, or democracy, or anocracy, or whatever. We're looking more at like military regimes versus single party regimes, personalist regimes, kind of the Geddes uh, um, right in France differentiations. And there, you know, it, it does seem like military regimes seem to be more likely to have discipline among their troops, uh, probably because in the way they manage their regime, they um, have found a way to sort of maintain a minimum winning coalition. But again, um, that's if you're only, if your entire movement strategy is focusing on dividing the military. And sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's on creating economic disruption or other things. Um, and then there are some times when um, military regimes precisely because their military regimes um, start to feel vulnerable to overt challenges, um, like in Myanmar or Burma, where they start to elevate reformers uh, in the latter part of last decade to avoid actually a mass movement setting on. Um, I guess the, the other thing I would say at this point is, you know, there, there is an interesting double standard that can sometimes uh, that, that, that I think can sometimes divert people from 
uh, the risks and sacrifices that come with nonviolent resistance. So for example, um, let's say there's a, a protest uh, in a square and there's hundreds of people there and 12 of them get killed by security forces. You'll hear people say, obviously they tried nonviolent action and it didn't work. And so they need to, or they, it was too dangerous, so they have to use violent action. And if you imagine um, the same exact setting where there might be guerrilla fighters engaging the, the military in the same square and 12 of those guerrilla fighters are killed, most people don't say, wow, that violent action was really unsuccessful. They need to use nonviolent action. Most people say they need to use more and better violence, <laughs> right? So like, it could be that being in the square protesting was not the right tactic, and they need to use more and better strategy. Um, but that there, there's no guarantee that, that moving to a violent uh, approach, a predominantly violent approach, is going to protect anybody. That's, the, the data just doesn't show that. Gary Sick. Yeah. because you are measuring, as I understood it, the last few weeks before the leader falls. And I would, and I think most of the scholars of the Iranian Revolution would say that after Jala Square, which was in September, uh, and the Shah really opened fire, or his forces did, on the, true, on the people, that then there was a, a Yep. And then when it came back again, the numbers were enormous and they were measurable. Yeah. There had been a you know nine months of lead up to that point that were very, very important with a lot of planning and, and so forth. So uh, my question is really that, you know, it, it's easier to count people when you know that there's something really big going on and you can see it and there's some documentation, though even there, Knowing how many people are out there in a square uh, on a given day is a very hard thing to do. So I'm just curious about your, your data collection. Second thing is, is uh, you talked about the regime. What about the leadership of the uh, the, the operation itself? Uh, the in the Iranian case, there were there were I mean Khomeini emerged at least right. as a single leader that people could rally around. There were there was a, there were other people would like to have had that position, but he he emerged as the leader. And they and, and he ran a pretty tight ship. They, pe people knew who they were taking orders from. There was a lot of coordination and clearance. And it paid off for them. You had, uh, when you got to the, you know, the Arab awakening, Egypt, uh, Syria, Tunisia, any number of other places, there was almost no leadership at all. I mean, it was a sort of collective that came and went, and they got together at various places, like at Tahrir Square, and, and, and talked about what they were doing. But there was no single leader. Does that really matter in the long run? And the third thing is that, with, in the case of the Shah, contrary to popular belief, he really wasn't very bloodthirsty, that he, in fact, decided not to shoot people, um, for the most part, and, in fact, his military people had a uh, plan all worked out that uh, would try to stop it. And I've had an argument publicly with uh, Erban Abrahamian, mm -hmm. and I argued that if the Shah had used those techniques that were at his command, he might very well have stopped it. Erban says he didn't have enough legitimacy and could never have carried it off. And you can argue that all day. But anyway, it's, but, but I'm, I'm curious about your take on this because in this case, he he could have been a lot more bloodthirsty than he was. And when he did shoot people, it actually didn't work, uh, as you pointed out. Yeah. Great. So uh, thanks for these. Uh, the first question about how, how do you measure people? So this is the answer is fairly unsatisfying for the first cut of the data, um, which was basically just um, estimating the number of people that were observed participating in peak event. So for example, for the Iranian revolution, it would be the however mil millions of people were there during the sort of major catalytic events prior to his departure. Yeah. 
Exactly. And, and then we look at um, uh, basically to, to count as a success, the, the outcome had to have happened within a year of that. So that, that's why that case sort of counts. Um, but I, I would say that uh, further, further studies have tried to look more at the sort of ebb and flow of, of participation. And um, this is especially important when it comes to counting people's participation in non-protest events, like strikes and other things, which can, like I said, be more impactful. So um, about 15 years ago, 10 years ago, it was pretty hard to get one's hands on reliable data like that. And it's just become so much easier with the data revolution, honestly. And um, people can now kind of go back through news reports and kind of triangulate much better. Um, they're all digitized now, where they weren't even when I was collecting these data. So, um, so it's very promising, and and I and others are kind of updating data uh, for that reason. Your second question about the leadership of the campaign. So I think you're pointing to something really important here about um, some of the different uh, pre-existing civil society organizations and their capacity for rapid mobilization to essentially consolidate power in the aftermath of the campaign. So the Iranian Revolution, I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of Eric explaining this because you're Gary Sick, but, um, but uh, for, for, for those who, who, who don't know as much, um, at the time, you know, the, the, um, the Khomeini was one element of it, but there was a really vibrant, like Marxist communist kind of um, uh, revival. Uh, in the 60s and, and leading up to this, and it was a really coalitional revolution. And then Khomeini and his group outbid them for power, consolidated, that's when the bloody part started, really, and, and now we have what we have, right? And so, um, you know, this is kind of a, this is pointing us to this idea that uh, the politics doesn't end when the dictator departs, and certainly in cases where you do have a very well-organized kind of command and control administrative uh, shadow government ready to swoop in, that's probably who's going to get it. Um, and the people who are less organized, less unified, still arguing among themselves about the program and the project are probably not going to be the ones who ascend. And um, so in the Arab Awakening, certainly in Tunisia, where there was more kind of a pre-existing civil society, particularly around labor uh, or in organized labor and kind of rule of law-like organizations, um, it's not surprising that they end up being able to really engage in, in what's the Nobel Peace Prize winning series of coalitional negotiations and debates leading to the outcome we see there compared to groups that were highly fragmented and disorganized uh, in other cases. Um, and in Egypt in particular, the Muslim Brotherhood versus the sort of nationalist um, uh, and secular military elements um, coming back into power, I think, is, is you know, the, the ongoing struggle there. Um, so um, some of the people who are working in this field right now are looking more at this question about coalitional dynamics and how you maintain a coalition to consolidate power that's inclusive in the aftermath. But one thing I will say is that our data sh shows really clearly that when revolutions take place and they're primarily nonviolent, the Iranian and Egyptian cases are the exceptions rather than the rule. Usually you see a, a larger turn toward democratic governance, um, a lower possibility into relapse into civil war, and higher human development indicators in almost every measure. Um, finally, on the Shah, um, so yes, uh, I think that it's true that he was restrained, um, and who knows why. Maybe he was concerned about legacy. Maybe he knew he was dying and he didn't want to, right, we don't know. But, um, but I do think that part of the calculation may have been one that we know many other uh, such leaders have had, and they're uh, kind of pinnacle or their, their key moments, which is, are they going to disobey me if I make this order? And that's for them the crucial thing they don't want to have. They don't, I mean, more than anything, what they don't want is defection. And if there was already word that there were low level, like foot soldier type conscripts, and even some of the Savak who were abandoning ship, he probably thought it's not going to happen. So I better get out of here while I can, right? <laughs> um, while I have some loyalists to get me out of here. Um, so that could have been part of it too. And, and I, I think that's part of why Evan Perkoski and I are finding this, this pattern that for many of the nonviolent campaigns up against governments that have used mass killings in the, in the recent past, 
they are so terrified of defection that they don't even risk the order. I have several uh, questions from the front row. Uh, others further back may have to raise their arms high and wave to be sure I don't overlook you, but uh, Peter is next. Thanks for a great talk. Um, I love the discussion about leader versus leaderless. And so it got me thinking about the February Revolution in 1917 mm -hmm. in Russia. Yeah. So where in your methodology would you affix a category to what happened there? How does that fit into this model? The February versus October revolutions. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So okay. So the I so starting even earlier, um, we have the 1905 in here. It's coded as a primarily nonviolent campaign as a partial success, um, not a full success. And then we have 2017 in here as an arm, primarily armed campaign. Um, although I buy the idea that the February parts were armed, but primarily nonviolent. Um, and then the October part was the, the sort of consolidation phase. Um, so that's how I would put it, although it's not quite um, disaggregated in that way and, and the campaign level data set. So I guess to my second follow-up, I can't. Yeah. So it's a longer period than one year, obviously. Yeah. There, also, there are two different campaigns in the data. Count, yeah. Uh, strikes during the war. I mean, were there uh, yeah. events that you were tracking prior to February? Because February was a little spontaneous, too, in terms yeah. of the Women's Day demonstrations and what evolved. I don't know how many people saw that coming. Yeah, so um, so we have two campaigns. One is 1905 by itself, and then we have one in there. I think Russia. I think the Russian Revolution. We have 16 and 17 because I think what happened is we found some events that you could say were the same people um, engaging in mobilization period to period um, during that time uh, on a consistent enough basis that we we felt like we could link their their methods. So um, yes, yeah, some of them might have been anti-war, but to, to get into the data set, they had to be explicitly calling for the czar to leave. Yeah. Kim Martin. Karen, that was terrific. And I have two questions related to your observation that strikes tend to work better than just having all protests. The first is, does that mean that these tend to work better in wealthier societies where people can afford to lose their jobs without being in absolute poverty? Um, and the second question is, do they work better in societies that have a high degree of social trust, where if somebody loses their job because they've been out on strike, they've got neighbors who will take care of them? Yeah, great question. So first, um, they don't happen more in wealthy societies. Uh, we looked at uh, different kinds of economic output measures and inequality measures, and there's no correlation um, with the onset of nonviolent campaigns, although certainly armed campaigns set on in countries that have lower GDP per cap and higher inequality. Um, strikes specifically, um, I think, uh, I, I haven't actually looked at measures trying to predict their onset, but I can tell you, at least from the South African case, that it was mostly the impoverished areas that were engaging in boycotts of, of white businesses and striking. But they did do weeks and weeks of community preparation in advance of these. Uh, both to raise funds for legal defenses for those that would be arrested during the boycotts. They, um, they purchased a number of toys and other things for humanitarian reasons because there were going to be holidays um, and they didn't know how long the boycotts would take place and they didn't want the children to go without gifts. Um, and those were distributed within the community. Uh, there were uh, many different food stores and other things that were used uh, to distribute across the community. And um, by and large, there was just an encouragement to purchase from only black-owned uh, businesses or to purchase from your, your black neighbor, essentially. But this was like exclusively township activity. And um, in, in other cases, I, none of the other like kind of iconic cases are coming to mind as easily for me as that one. But I, I think that that shows that there are ways that people can innovate this. Of course, it can't be sustained forever, but they, they can usually sustain long enough to do actual economic damage. And then um, the, your question about social trust, I think, is really good. And I think that social trust seems to be really important among those that feel that they're, um, that they're mobilizing together for a common purpose. Um, and then it's something that has to essentially be built with those that are fence sitters or kind of passively sympathetic. 
Um, and so many different campaigns have spent significant periods of time talking to community members about what their concerns are prior to mobilizing. One of the best stories about this is um, James Lawson, who was the, the minister who organized the lunch counter sit-ins in Nashville in, um, in the late 50s. Um, he, he, he was like sent by Martin Luther King there to do this. So he's like, go to Nashville and desegregate it. And uh, so James Lawson had been in India. He'd been a conscientious objector during the Korean War. He'd learned a ton about how to do nonviolent action. He was the one who sort of introduced it to Martin Luther King. And so um, when he got to Nashville as an outsider, he thought he needed to spend a full year talking with essentially women in their homes about what their main grievances were about life in Nashville. And he's, he, he came to hear this very common story, which he didn't expect to hear, which is they said, I'm ashamed of the fact that my children wear ill-fitting clothes because in the department stores, they won't let us try them on. And if we buy them and they don't fit, they won't let us return them. And I have to explain to my child why they don't get to wear fitting clothes like the white kids. And he heard this over and over, and he realized if we're going to desegregate Nashville, I have to start with the shopping district because these women will come if we do that. And he was right. So then he got, you know, he, he moved from there a year of what he calls the one-on-one -on -one work where they establish trust and then build the community goal around something that is tied to an expressed grievance. Then he could get people who were willing to come and do their training, the preparation, um, they trained to be harassed on the, the lunch counters, um, they raised legal funds, and they waged a totally effective campaign uh, to do what was seemingly impossible at the beginning. Dipali? Um, thank you for your talk, Eric. That's so interesting. I, I'm wondering if you can say a little bit about the international, uh, the role of international audiences. So. Is there an analog in protest to, you know, Clifford Bob's idea of marketing rebellion, like that you're trying to get some external validation of the project? And, and are there consequences to that that can be undermining in terms of having protest movements be external facing? Some of my work in Syria, we found that, you know, national opposition were very focused on getting external support and that undercut them internally. Um, and then I'm also wondering, is there a sort of saturation effect that might explain this paradox that people are just seeing lots of people in the street and then nothing happens? Or it, and if you can just talk about what, especially internationally, how that might be working. Yeah, great questions. So. The role of international actors. Um, so Maria and I were wondering whether international support helped or hurt these movements. And so at the time um, for our 2011 book, we collected a pretty blunt measure, which was whether they got direct um, material assistance from a foreign state. And then we looked at whether there's sanctions against the regime, um, and then whether the regime had powerful clients essentially backing it up. And what we found is that um, the only measure that really seemed to matter for nonviolent campaigns was whether a powerful ally with, withheld support from a regime. So like Ronald Reagan's attache calling Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines and saying, we're not going to have your back if you like shoot these people. Um, and uh, so that seemed to be influential in explaining at least the timing of certain events, but not necessarily whether the campaign succeeded overall, um, at least not on average. Um, and in later work uh, with Maria, actually our, our current project is collecting much more nuanced data on different types of assistance. So whether it's more moral support, technical assistance, financial assistance, diplomatic cover, um, direct participation or media uh, support, and then uh, by which types of actors. So are they states, are they IGOs, are they INGOs, are they like transnational solidarity networks? Um, and then we're looking at the timing of the, of the support. So whether it's something that kind of creates an enabling environment, um, or is it something that is meant to influence the campaign as it's ongoing. And so far, what I, what I think we're finding is that um, INGO and, and kind of non-state support can be uh, helpful in campaigns um, 
basically getting large scale participation. Um, but state support can be more influential in the post campaign phase when negotiations are taking place to develop the kind of post revolutionary order. Um, but the, the downside, of course, with states directly supporting these movements is that it allows the regime to validate its propaganda against the movement as a foreign conspiracy. It may undermine the movement's own bases of domestic support and create like free riding effects. Um, and I think that it actually, uh, the international community doesn't really have a doctrine to deal with this. So a lot of times um, they won't get taken seriously anyway unless somebody shows up looking like they're in a uniform and saying they're gonna <laughs> use arms. Um, so that gets rewarded a bit more. Um, Nisha Fazal has written about this, about just the, the sort of perverse incentive for secessionist movements to use violence because then they're taken seriously. Um, and then uh, the other thing I would say about Syria in particular is that um, the intervention in Libya definitely became the reference point for many in the Syrian National Council. And I was I was sort of listening to a bunch of, of people in that group lobbying directly for the Libya model, is what they were calling it. Um, and I think that the, what happened is that it created an expectation among many people within the country that they could engage in some riskier behavior because the international community was going to come. And I think that led to fragmentation. It led for early militarization of the conflict and was altogether a, a disaster. And then um, in terms of this saturation effect, I think um, I would say, you know, uh, there definitely seems to be a normalization of protest in particular, but there are still campaigns out there that are doing things that are much more creative, uh, that are drawing attention. So Paige and I were talking before about the Hong Kong uh, demonstrators um, yeah, and the fact that they've started wearing masks recently, and the masks aren't Guy Fox masks, they're like um, masks that they're wearing because they're trying to show the world that you can still protest when there's uh, facial recognition out there, uh, technology, which up to now, everybody was wondering how we were gonna do this. Um, so, you know, there's always like a, somebody who's innovating something that can then kind of feed back into the common knowledge. Um, but uh, it could be that people have just become so used to seeing people engaging in street protests that they are more prone to ignore it. There's certainly media fatigue, um, but I also think that when these groups are creative, uh, it can really gain new attention. Jack Snyder. You uh, said several scattered things about why uh, movements choose the tactics and strategies they they do, but I was hoping we could kind of pursue that a, a little further. Now, um, one could imagine movements that choose their strategies based on what they think would be the most effective thing to do in the particular circumstances or movements that pick their strategy based on what they know how to do, what they're good at, uh, what occurs to them to be their mode of operation from what they're accustomed to in their culture. Um, and I'm guessing that you're um, not going to be on the side of the former, because it's your view that violence is never a better strategy, regardless of the circumstances. And from what you said today, it sounds like you think that striking is always the best strategy uh, if you can do it. Um, and uh, so um, it's really a question of, well, who can strike? or who has a routine where they know how to put on a strike. And so your example of the striking oil workers, well, they can strike because they're oil workers in a country that's totally dependent on oil income. Whereas, you know, unemployed landless peasants, they can't strike. Um, so it's uh, kind of capacity and whether they, they're organized to do it. Um, on the, the armed rebellion side, um, you know, how much of it is just whether 
the, the people that have the grievance and the base for a movement uh, know how to do something uh, other than uh, fighting a guerrilla war um, or whether they have social networks in the capital city so that they can organize sit-ins or demonstrations, but if they're uh, separatists off in the mountains and don't have friends in the capital city, they can't. So is it, is it really a kind of a supply side rather than a strategy side um, dynamic that explains why you get the, the strategies and tactics that you do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a great question and of course totally troubling from kind of a causation uh, perspective. Um, so I've sort of taken this question up a number of different ways. One was in uh, the book with Maria where what we tried to do is figure out whether there are any sort of systemic factors that seem to determine more whether people use nonviolent or violent action. And the only one that really comes out consistently is actually related to the claims of the movements and whether they're basically a territorial claim or a uh, anti-government claim. And it's much more common that secession movements in particular opt for, for armed resistance. And this may be precisely for the reasons you mentioned, that they're in the periphery, they're often ethnic minorities, uh, they can't necessarily form the types of um, either uh, social bonds necessary to elicit shifts in loyalty of the opponent or uh, and they uh, can't actually get the leverage because there's no way they can mobilize enough people on their own in order to bring these effects about. Um, so it is more common for secessionist campaigns to be armed than unarmed. I also think there's an international dimension to it. As I mentioned, the international community has to accede to secessionist claims for them to work. Uh, and to get on the international agenda, it's much easier to do it if you look like an army um, that has formed an, an erstwhile sovereign territory. Um, the other thing about it is that um, this doesn't necessarily mean that uh, only armed actions can yield effective secession outcomes. So, you know, East Timor is one of those cases where, you know, it's an anti-colonial campaign, technically secessionist at the time because of the annexation. That was a nonviolent movement that forged relationships directly with mainland Indonesian students uh, who then, like in solidarity, created a massive, totally effective transnational movement that had real leverage. Um, such that they you know, were able to lobby the US Congress to stop giving Suharto <laughs> military assistance he could use to, in, in occupied East Timor. Um, but also that created a major uh, crisis point during the Asian financial crisis where um, you know, the, the aid, the bailout from uh, the IMF was made conditional on Suharto's recognition of independence and a transition into that. So essentially I think that that's a case where uh, it shows that the, the same dynamics obtain, but it's a long game and it takes more for these minority movements in large countries to, to build those political alliances that allow them the leverage they need. Um, and that's, you know, it might just be that they don't want to wait that long or something, right? But armed action didn't work for East Timor at all. Uh, so it was, for them, they felt their only choice at the time. So um, the other thing I would say is, is I've done some work with Jay Olfelder trying to understand, is it about having a, a relevant history of nonviolent action or strike behavior that helps people connect and know the techniques of rebellion? Is it that they have pre-existing organizational resources that they can use like um, uh, labor unions and, and other things like this? Have they used strikes before um, is, is one of our key indicators. Um, is it that they are, reside in a country that provides them political opportunities for leverage, um, more politically open societies or places that don't commit as many human rights abuses? Or is it more like a cultural thing? Like, um, you know, some countries are just more, it, it's sort of like a modernization hypothesis. Like, are, are some people just more culturally prone to using nonviolent action and, and liberalizing themselves um, compared to others? And the, none of those um, 
groups of explanations helped us to predict the onset of nonviolent uprisings. But there was one factor that came out really consistently, and that is actually a, a recent reversal in human rights um, practices. So actually, the, the only thing that's very consistent is that a regime has recently begun to become more abusive toward its population. That is what <laughs> is the best predictor of whether there's a mass movement underway. And, and with armed action, the best, yeah. The tactics of the yeah, yeah, of, of nonviolent action. Of yeah. Nonviolent. yeah. yeah. Compared to, to armed action, um, you know, the, 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 the things that predict that are well known in the field. And they're actually, you know, largely different factors. The nonviolent campaigns seem to set on in a much more random distribution than the, than the armed campaigns, which set on in, in predictable places. Uh, hi, my, my name is Tendor. Um, you? I, I Good to see you. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. Um, and I was thinking about the role of uh, the, the role of religion and the idea that uh, religion can often play an important part in fueling and sustaining the kind of mass mobilization that seems extremely necessary to success. Uh, if that's one of the main mechanisms that lead to success, um, would you think there might be anything? Uh, to do with the decline of religion that may be reflected in the decline of uh, success rate of nonviolent resistance? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, so there is someone who's looking into this. His name is Isak Svensson, um, and he's a professor at Uppsala University. Um, so you could check out some of what he's written about it. Uh, I think what, what, I, what I'm just am impressionistically going to say is that most of the campaigns that have set on recently have had some connection to a faith community, um, even if their overarching narrative and frame is more secular, it is often the case that, there's, that, that a religious community is part of their coalition, at least. And in fact, that that can be really important in providing these groups with some degree of immunity um, while they're doing training and preparation. Um, but also faith communities can be really powerful in helping to um, uh, min, you know, sort of navigate conflict resolution within the movement. So um, I think that there's, you know, I think you're on to something, but I, I think that the data, just like thinking through some of the more recent cases are probably still kind of prominently featuring uh, religious institutions to some degree or another. Although it's, you know, it's not the same as, as some of the earlier kind of iconic movements we have where it was much more front and center part of the, the movement's claims and narratives. Mm -hmm. Nancy Collins. Um, thank you for such a thought-provoking talk. Um, I have a methodological follow-up question. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit um, about the impact of the data revolution on your research. <coughs> so, for example, that say some of the revolutions and movements from 2011 and 2012, there would be just so much more access to information than, say, a 1978 to 1989. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, wondering if you could speak to some of the uh, both opportunities mm -hmm. that that presents. The, the, the newer revolutions and movements, as it were, mm -hmm. as well as what you, in a sense, would have liked the data to be able to tell you about some of the earlier ones, mm -hmm. that simply by, by, by limitation of the data, it is impossible to assess. So that how that changes the framing of the mm -hmm. questions, even some of the conceptualization of your future uh, research in light of some of these um, new new tools that you would that you have now and you'll have going forward or can even expect to be enhanced and refined going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I'll, I'll first of all just recommend a, a source. Um, there's an edited volume by a guy named Maciej Berkowski called Recovering Nonviolent History. And it's actually about earlier movements, uh, much earlier, but um, the, 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 one of the interesting issues about this field is that we haven't even had a term for civil resistance until Gandhi. He, he's the one who gave it its name. So, and he sort of borrowed it from what people were calling Thoreau's pamphlet, mm -hmm. Civil Disobedience. Thoreau didn't title his pamphlet that. That's what it was called retrospectively. <laughs> and Gandhi had read it and was inspired by it and then retooled the word to civil resistance 
um, because he hated the British using the term passive resistance, um, which he thought evoked a submissive element. And so before that, people weren't calling it anything, right? <laughs> so, so like in, in the, it didn't have a name. In the American Revolution, people are like, uh, you know, there's agitation around the Stamp Act. And you're like, <laughs> what do you mean, agitation? And so, you know, you've had these historians, like this guy, Walter Conser, who has a chapter in this book, who's, who's going back and he said, when they said agitation, I went back and I read all of the reports from the very few newspapers that, it, that existed at the time, and some eyewitness accounts from diaries, and it turned out they were totally using civil resistance, mm -hmm. but nobody had a name for it yet. But if you sort of think about, like, the Continental Congress, um, and uh, the Declaration of Independence itself. Uh, the Declaration of Independence itself was an act of nonviolent resistance. Now they, they had, at the time already, um, there were shots fired, but there was a lively, robust debate happening between Quakers in the colonies and the radical partisan patriots um, between whether it was smarter for them to continue to wage their economic non-cooperation or to essentially have things heat up and, and engage in an armed uh, struggle. And um, you know, many people thought the Quakers were gonna win the argument until the shots were fired at Lexington and Concord, which kind of silenced debate. Um, but up until then, there were 10 years of sustained nonviolent resistance in, in the colonies. So like, that, that case alone kind of illustrates the problem, right? More contemporarily, I mean, we have a lot of really good records of the Iranian Revolution. There were a lot of Western journalists there. There were a lot of non-Western journalists there. We have, we know a lot of what went on, um, and it's pretty good. But it was mostly in books when I did the study. So I was reading tons of books, including, you know, Ibram, um, uh, Irvin's book and other people's. Charles Kurtzman has a great book on it. Um, and now, you know, reporters know who to ask because people tweet out that they're at Tarpier Square and they have 200,000 followers, so the reporters know to talk to that person. And there's just much more immediate um, and triangulated sourcing for information in real time about what's happening in a demonstration. And so um, because of that, I think that um, we have to navigate a lot of issues around veracity and reporting, um, the sort of political motivations for over and undercounting things. Um, and so I've moved much more toward doing like ranges of counts rather than absolute counts and things along those lines to try to mitigate that. Um, but um, I think it, it basically just means we need to tri triangulate claims better, but there's a lot more available for us to do that too. So it's exciting as an opportunity. Have I missed anyone's question? Okay, yeah. My uh, name is Adam. I had a question about what you were uh, terming smart repression, and particularly this, quest this uh, idea of the planning phase of these uh, protest movements. Is it a problem as well that these smart repression tools are being used to disrupt the planning phase of these, and that may be part of the reason that we're seeing less planning, is that it's just more dangerous to make yourself, you know, to, to be involved with that stage, that it's better to be more spontaneous, that there's less of an opportunity for the regime to break up the, the process before it can take off. Yeah, so um, there's sort of two models of revolutionary momentum out there. One is that basically, basically people kind of quietly work behind the scenes and wait for something to happen that triggers mass mobilization, and then you go out and try to organize it. <laughs> Um, and so that's you know why you why some people uh, say we've seen things like the East European or the Eastern uh, the East Germany surprise and and things along those lines because nobody really knows anybody's private preferences until somebody heard a joke on a train that you weren't supposed to be able to say and then all of a sudden everybody's telling the joke and two days later everybody's in the streets right um, so that's one model the other model is this kind of quietly organizing planning and preparing type of uprising. Um, and uh, I think that what happened in the, in the 2000s, like 2000 to 2010, uh, was that in the first part of that decade, that was happening quite a lot. Um, but it was happening offline in apartments and, and on college campuses and stuff like that. And I think that really the, the, the digital way of organizing has put a lot of that stuff online. And so yes, if the question is whether 
people organizing in the way people organize today makes them vulnerable for smart repression? The answer is totally yes, because if you're doing it in Facebook message groups or whatever, like, absolutely. But if, if people are doing it um, uh, in, on college campuses in person, there's some kind of mitigation around, you know, leaving phones outside or whatever, um, then it can be like it always has been. People have to do their due diligence and know who they're talking to. It's always more vulnerable in urban settings than in rural settings where people know if you're an outsider. <laughs> um, but, you know, it, it's sort of like, take, you know, taking the same precautions that underground movements have always taken. Um, and, and so I, I don't, I, I just think the problem is people default to a digital mode instead of analog mode. Yes. Hey, Professor, thank you so much for your words. Um, I'm studying environmental science and policy here with a background in advocacy and activism. And two general questions, I'm curious about your advice um, for uh, what seems to be a skyrocketing climate movement. Um, the first one, I guess, is about like the larger phenomenology in that there is not a clearly oppressive regime enemy. In this, it's a systemic issue that's deeply intertwined to our political economic system. Um, people would say it's not violent when what we learn in climatology class predicts unfathomable amounts of violence across the world. Um, so how, you know, yeah, advice about this kind of common, en like, I guess, I sort of say enemy, but like trajectory when it's so less clear and less visible. And then the second one is a question, you know, the misfortune of several of my classmates after learning the climatology f feel really hopeless. Um, I was joking with someone recently about, well, I guess it's Green New Deal or Children of Men in this uh, you know, dystopic book and film of a world where humanity is faced with kind of inevitable extinction. Um, and I, you know, looking at the loss of hope being a, a, a horrible challenge to the climate movement, because it feels like once we enter that, um, there's less possibility um, to catalyze momentum which is definitely what we need, as you, as you talked about. So yeah, any thoughts in your, in your studies about hope and its relationships to movement and how it empowers and, yeah. Yeah, great questions. So the second one first, um, one of my favorite quotes about this whole field is from Asaf Bayat, who said that nothing as much as revolution requires hope, creates hope, and betrays hope. Um, <laughs> And hope is the thing, right? Uh, all, all uprisings, all revolutions, all mass movements rely on it fundamentally. And um, there's a new book out by a guy named uh, James Jasper who does a lot on the emotions of protest. And it seems that the most important combo is hope and anger. Um, so if you it, it, see if you can up on the hope and add, add a sprinkle of uh, outrage and then you know, um, the, affect, the affect is in motion. Um, and I think uh, that's part of why the climate movement is getting where it's getting right now. Um, I think that there's a, the, the youth-led elements of it, there's a really clear expression of anger uh, at the inaction of adults. Um, one of the interesting stories from the crowd counting that Jeremy and I have been doing um, is from Portland, Maine, where uh, the students organized 2,000 people to walk out um, during the climate strike on, um, on the 21st or the 20th. And uh, the student organizer who was 14 said, I'm outraged that I can't vote yet because if me and my classmates could vote, things would be totally different. And because we can't vote, we have to come out here to make you people who can vote <laughs> listen to us, you know? And so it's very interesting that they seem to get it in a way um, that, that this is what protest is for. It's about changing the conversation, creating a crisis, really, um, and then uh, creating action around uh, the desired outcome. So I think, you know, with any kind of movement where the opponent is multifaceted and multi-tiered, um, and the, the, the goal is true behavior change at a system level, um, that's a really difficult thing. But um, there are many different system level practices in the world that no longer exist because of mass movements, 
um, one of the most entrenched institutions of the past 500 years was slavery and transnational, is particularly the triangle trade. And um, you know, it took 60 years of a committed, costly international movement, um, but that was ended, right? And and people at the beginning of that would have said the people who are calling for abolition of slavery are totally bizarre and marginal and unimportant in society and don't know what they're talking about and are naive and radical. Um, so, you know, it only happens if people do it. Um, so anyway, I, I would just say um, I don't have any advice because, um, you know, I would like to be, but I'm not an oracle. But I would say that, um, that there, there are plenty of precedents for ordinary people waging um, you know, concerted strategic struggles and changing the world. Jack? Oh, two finger? Can you ask on the, on the climate strike moment? So not asking you to be an oracle, <laughs> um, but asking you to think about your research on what makes movements more or less successful. Um, and in this case, there's the difficulty of the amorphous nature of what needs to change and who needs to change. Um, but from what you know, um, I, I'm not going to ask you to, for a prediction of whether it's successful, but what, what aspects of the current climate movement makes you think it would be more successful and what things make it make you think it would be less successful and that's a way of also saying like if you could advise this movement which things would you say keep doing this and stop doing that and do this instead yeah okay so a couple of things one is is uh, concrete goals are are useful and um so let's just take extinction rebellion as an example uh, part of this larger global movement um, right now in, in London, Extinction Rebellion is shutting down Westminster Bridge, uh, Westminster for like two weeks, right? And they're on day three of it. Some lots of people are starting to get arrested. The the area is just covered with babies and toddlers, uh, and it's the most multi generational thing I've ever seen. They arrested a 92 year old man today, um, and it's very diverse. It's hugely participatory. Extinction Rebellion is very well organized and very intentional about being well organized in the UK, and now has chapters worldwide. And um, I think one of the things that they do really well is they have three concrete goals. Mm -hmm. um, the first is to tell the truth about climate change. The second is to convene a people's assembly to talk about uh, global solutions. And the third is to achieve um, carbon neutrality by 2025. So um, I thought those were ambitious. And I used to think that the hardest thing to do would be to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2025. But the more I think about it, the more I realize the hardest one is getting people to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Telling the, if, if people told the truth, it might be OK. Um, so so I don't know. I think, I think that they have some concrete goals that are very ambitious, but I think that um, uh, just asking people to do something is almost never the thing to, the, the, the claim around which to frame a movement. So do something, fix this for us, or whatever is less effective than here are the three things. If, we, if you do them, we'll stop interfering with your, your Wednesday. Um, and then the, the second thing is, is you know, large-scale diverse participation. That, that seems to be happening, and increasingly so. There's definitely a, a kind of a sense of urgency, I think, that has emerged that is, um, you know, going to help with mobilization. Um, I think uh, the other thing is the variety of methods. That is definitely on display in a lot of these movements, and I think we'll catch on in the U.S. a little bit as well. The thing that I think they haven't done as much um, outside the UK is shifting the pillars of support. So there's, they, they're, in, in the UK, Extinction Rebellion's made a lot of progress with getting on the par parliamentary agenda. They, the parliament passed a law uh, declaring a climate emergency this summer, which was a big deal. It wouldn't have happened without the movement. Um, but in other parts of the, the world right now, it's a lot less, you, you see a lot less of that. So. I think um, you know getting pillars of support to get on the side of the movement or at least stand out of their way is, is going to be pretty critical for them. Uh, 
Okay, we have five minutes. Let's collect all of the three questions I can see and have you, you yeah. answer and give final parting words. So that'll be Jack, Peter, and the person in the back. I was really struck by your findings on flank violence. Um, it could be because the two times that I've been tear gassed was the, as the result of flank violence. Um, and uh, what struck me about your remarks was not just that flank violence uh, has negative consequences for the success of the movement, but if I understood what you were saying, it's unpredictable, it's uncontrollable by the organizers, uh, or at least not reliably controllable, and that it has a tendency to go down a slippery slope towards all violence. And um, although this conclusion that I, I would draw about it seems to run kind of counter to a lot of the thrust of your other analysis, uh, if flank violence is so dangerous and is, by your chart, like a major cause of the worst results over the last 10 years, um, should movements just not be doing uh, marching in large numbers of people in the central square of uh, the city? And should they instead be shifting to things like boycotts? Yeah. Just a quick follow-on on Syria that, that Polly raised. So if some of the lessons learned from the protests were maybe if we take a more violent approach and we elicit a reaction, we can get international intervention if I heard that right. I was wondering about Assad. Mm -hmm. Did he pick up on any lessons from what he observed both in Tahrir and then later in Libya? Yeah. That, in other words, why did he opt to go for such a harsh reaction to a pretty peaceful group with moderate demand in Oh, and there's one more. Yeah, you mentioned during your talk that uh, the presence and the participation of women is an important predictor of success. And you, you touched on it a little bit when you were talking about Extinction Rebellion and how diverse that movement is. But I wonder if there's any data showing the effect of racial or socioeconomic or generational diversity in a movement and participating how successful it's going to be. Great. So, um, yeah, so Jack, on your question about violent flanks, uh, there are a few different things movements have done to try to prevent violent flanks from overtaking, particularly their message um, and the political effects of their action. Um, so some movements um, that feel like they are already kind of going to do protests and demonstrations will try to mitigate um, provocateurs on site. So uh, they'll prepare a group of people to do interpositioning, for example, which is when like 40 people will like surround them all of a sudden and block them away. Um, sometimes they'll have peace marshals or whatever, and they come up with a strategy in advance to minimize or curtail the, the, the provocateurs. Another option is shifting to other methods that don't um, attract violent flanks as easily, um, like boycotting um, in uh, Silent marches are actually a really good technique for this because it's super obvious who's not, who didn't get the memo. Um, if you if you if you do a silent march, um, but it also silent marches um, can create real powerful theater um, when counter protesters or police are being really agitated um, because the silent march you've agreed you're not going to open your mouth and so it just creates this total absurdity. Um, and then you can easily spot and isolate provocateurs or just say they're not part of us. Um, the core uh, rules that were distributed in the early 60s among different civil rights activists made very clear that um, if you are part of um, one of our marches, these are the expectations of you. They even had a dress code um, in that case. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they made clear that in their, that for their movement, if you didn't abide by these, we would assume you're an agent provocateur and we'll turn you back into the police where you came from. So, <laughs> so it's actually like a pretty interesting uh, decision on their part, but that is actually very controversial in a lot of contemporary movements where there's much more discourse that 
Uh, different tactics should be allowed when people are being attacked by police. You should be able to use self-defense. Um, and, um, and there's a lot of contro controversy about who has the right to tell other people, especially when they're being attacked um, and are attacked routinely in life, that they can't use whatever they're in possession of to defend themselves. So that is a legitimate like set of debates out there. Um, but there, the recognition has to be that there are always political consequences when that happens. So then um, on the Assad uh, uh, question, Assad, I think, learned a couple of things very early on. Um, the first thing he learned is that he was going to try to comply with some of the lesser demands of the movement. And he offered a number of concessions, including holding elections and having like a constitutional reboot and everything early on when the demonstrations started. But at the same time, he did send in um, the army. Um, there were defectors immediately among uh, the sort of foot soldiers because they were Sunni conscripts. Um, so he executed a huge number of these defectors, put the army back in the barracks, and then sent in the Air Force very early on in the conflict. Many of the different defectors who then left the regime went straight to Turkey. Turkey granted them sanctuary. Um, when that started, they started mobilizing the campaign to uh, intervene. Um, and I think that, you know, Assad essentially learned that he could, um, he needed to rely on his allies. He needed to not piss off the Russians and the Iranians as long as they um, were going to come to his defense. Um, and he didn't actually send in regular conscripts uh, that he might be able to wait it out. Um, I also think that the movement uh, was winning. <laughs> when they were undermined uh, by regional actors and, and military elements. And, um, and if it weren't for those dynamics, they may actually have succeeded. Um, and then in terms of this other question about um, other types of diversity within the movements, um, I think the general consensus in the field of civil resistance among qualitative researchers is that the, 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 the most politically effective forms of uh, political power um, are those that, rep that show that there's universal legitimacy behind a claim. And so if in a society there are deep cleavages or polarization across sectarian lines or class lines, movements that can bridge those look like on the face to be very legitimate. So that's why I say um, the uprising in Venezuela last year came across as potentially more legitimate to many of the um, people who were rising up against Maduro than the one that happened a few years before now, which was largely an urban elite kind of um, uh, exclusionary of the poor and their concerns. Um, and so there, there's some um, maybe more legitimacy because there was cross-class collaboration, at least at the beginning. Um, I think that the, the women's mobilization generally signals uh, that like everybody's coming, even <laughs> you know it, it, it sort of set, it, it creates a, a bit of common knowledge about the fact that um, you know in the the photos I was showing you of the grandmother in Algeria, she's like I've never done a protest before. I'm out here because I can't buy bread and I'm trying to feed 20 people and this is ridiculous, you know. And she's like yelling at the police that they're in her way and everything. So you know there's something about those types of claims that then give a sense more broadly to the society that this is a universal movement, not just one representing a particular um, partisan or kind of um, um, maybe cynical uh, political play. Well, thanks. And I want you to get me a civil resistance movement going in North Korea. <laughs> <laughs>